the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on the first day of the week was foreshadowed right back in the ritual of the law of Moses when the sheaf of the first fruits was waved on the day after the Sabbath, the first day of the week. And from this first day, the children of Israel then had to count seven Sabbaths <coughs> And on the day after the seventh Sabbath, so that's the 50th day, they kept the Feast of the First Fruits, or the Feast of Weeks. And on this day, they had to bring another wave offering, two wave loaves, which were baked with leaven. And we saw how that those two wave loaves pointed forward to the bringing in of both Jews and Gentiles into the purpose of God. And, and that day when they kept the Feast of the First Fruits corresponds in the New Testament to the day of Pentecost that we've just read about in Acts chapter 2. And so this is what we're going to look at in this final study together. But I'd like us to begin in Luke's Gospel and chapter 24, because here we are in the company of the Lord Jesus Christ as he... Uh, converses with his disciples during the 40 days that he spent with them after that he had risen again from the dead and before he ascended up into heaven. And the record makes it very clear that Jesus spent much of this time discussing with them and expounding unto them the Old Testament scriptures and, and explaining to them that the things that they had witnessed that had happened were actually foretold way back in the word of God, in the law and in the Psalms and in the prophets. And so Jesus says, if we pick up verse 45, it says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So I want us to notice here, first of all, that in particular, Jesus, in his discussions with his disciples at this point, focuses on two main themes. First of all, that Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead. And secondly, that repentance and forgiveness of sins uh, should be preached among all nations, not just the Jewish nation. And both of these things, Jesus said, were foretold in the scripture. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the bringing in of the Gentiles into the purpose of God. And uh, we're not going to do this now, but you might want to think um, when you have a moment, about maybe what scriptures, what Old Testament scriptures you would use to prove these two things, that Christ should suffer and rise from the dead and that uh, the purpose of God should be opened up unto the Gentiles. Where could we go in the Old Testament to prove those two things? <clears throat> but, you know, what a privilege it must have been for those disciples to listen to the greatest exponent of the word of God, to listen to the, the risen Lord expounding the Old Testament for those 40 days. But just notice what Jesus says to them in verse 40, 48. He says, and ye are witnesses of these things, by which, of course, he meant his death and resurrection. Ye are witnesses of these things. And it's in this context of the disciples being witnesses of these things to the resurrection of Jesus Christ that Jesus then goes on to say to them in verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he's talking there when he talks about the promise of my father. He is, of course, talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we looked at this briefly yesterday when we 
looked at Jesus' teaching regarding the Comforter. But the, the important thing for us to grasp at this point is that the giving of the Holy Spirit, the promise of my Father, to the disciples was for a particular purpose. It was to be an <coughs> integral part of their witnessing to the resurrection of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit was going to help them in their witnessing to the fact of the risen Lord. Now, Jesus commands his disciples here to remain in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon them. In fact, he says there in verse 49, he uses an interesting word. He said that they would be endued with power from on high. And that's an interesting word. It, it actually means to be clothed. And uh, again, we're not going to dwell on this at this point, but Jesus is actually using Old Testament language here because there's a number of occasions in the Old Testament where men received the Spirit of God and it enabled them to do things like prophesy, for example, and they were said to have been clothed with the Holy Spirit. So, for example, Gideon in Judges chapter 6, it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And the Hebrew word there means the same thing. It means to be clothed. Amasai in 1 Chronicles 12, same thing. The Spirit came upon Amasai, who was the chief of the captains. <coughs> And just another one, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, in Second uh, Chronicles 24. Same thing, the Spirit of God came upon him. And it means that he was clothed with the Spirit. So that's just an interesting little word study. But with that background, let's now go then to the Acts of the Apostles and uh, pick up the narrative in Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. And verse 4. And Luke says, And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. And what, what's pretty clear, I think, is that this is actually the same record as Luke 24. So in effect, Luke here is taking up the story where he left off in, in his first volume at the end of his Gospel, what he calls here the former treatise. So Luke's now taking up the story where his Gospel left off. And interestingly, Jesus says here that they should wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. And again, he's clearly talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I think he's referring back to his discourse concerning the Comforter that we looked at yesterday in John's Gospel, chapter 14 in particular. But what's the context here in Acts chapter 1? Well, it shouldn't surprise us to see that it's all about the resurrection of Jesus. So just as we saw in Luke 24, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, was all to do with witnessing to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 1. It says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Luke says that the disciples had received many infallible proofs. Jesus showed himself alive to them, and he spoke to them 
concerning the kingdom of God. And the disciples saw and heard things that proved the fact of the risen Christ. And, and the Holy Spirit that they were to receive was, was given for the purpose of helping them to convince others that the Lord Jesus Christ really had risen from the dead. Well, we'll come back to Acts chapter 1 in a minute, but let's just flick over to Mark chapter 16. Because this connection between the resurrection of Jesus and the giving of the Holy Spirit comes across very clearly here in Mark's Gospel. And we all know verse 16. Mark 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We all know this verse off by heart. And I would suggest, actually, that we are so familiar with this verse that sometimes we tend to overlook what Jesus is really talking about here. Because when Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptised shall be saved... What does Jesus actually mean? What's he talking about? Believeth what? And the answer is that Jesus is talking about his resurrection. And, and if you just read the verse in the context, this is very clear. Because Mark 16 points out time and time again that the disciples repeatedly failed to believe the fact of the resurrection, so much so that Jesus had to rebuke them. Let's just have a look. Verse 11, first of all. It says, And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Verse 13. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And so when Jesus then says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, he is talking primarily about belief in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Of that, I think there can be no doubt. But notice what he then says in verse 17. <clears throat> he says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And of course, these things were accomplished as a result of the distribution of the power of the Holy Spirit that the disciples received. And so these signs would testify to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what the work of the Holy Spirit in the first century was really all about. Because, of course, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as we've seen, is the very foundation of our faith Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. And so this is what the, the gospel hinges upon, the, the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, let's go back then now to Acts chapter 1 and uh, join the chapter in verse 6. And I want us to notice again that there is emphasis here on the fact that the Holy Spirit would first of all enable the disciples to witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and would secondly signify that the Gentiles would become incorporated into the purpose of God. Look at verse 6. It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the <coughs> uttermost parts of the earth. So they were to be witnesses to his resurrection. And I just wonder, have we ever noticed how Luke here in Acts chapters 1 and 2 goes out of his way to emphasise the fact that the apostles had witnessed the resurrection by the things that they saw and heard? Let's just... Whip through these two chapters very quickly. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. It says that he showed himself by infallible proofs. They'd seen it. They'd heard him speaking. Verse 9. It says while they beheld. Verse 10. They looked steadfastly towards heaven. Verse 11. The angels talked about them seeing him go into heaven. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, Peter says, we all are witnesses. Verse 33, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Can you see the emphasis through these two chapters? The message could not be clearer. What they saw and what they heard was infallible proof. Of the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the, the operation of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and beyond was, was a, just an extension to their witness to those in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, um, Simeon mentioned chiasms uh, the other day. I want to just show you this. There's a there's a lovely chiastic structure in Acts chapter 1 that, that serves to, to emphasise that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was, was an absolutely fundamental aspect of the gospel of salvation and, and that the purpose of God in restoring again the kingdom to Israel could not be accomplished without the resurrection of Jesus. Just have a look at that and, and just see how the, the first part of Acts chapter 1 is structured. Can you see that at each end of this chiasm, there's emphasis on the fact that the disciples saw the risen Lord. And at the very centre of this chiasm is, is the focus of the, the ultimate purpose of God of restoring again the kingdom to Israel. Here's another one. In, this is Acts chapter 2. And you can see straight away from this <coughs> diagram that the purpose of this chiasm, right in the centre, is to focus our minds on the main theme of Acts chapter 2, which is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And it's here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And we know that this is talking about the resurrection of Jesus. So this is the whole point of Peter's speech that we've just read from Acts chapter 2, given on the day of Pentecost. And, and the structure of the chapter gives emphasis to this fact that this is the main point. And I think these structures like this are wonderful because they, they really are the fingerprint of inspiration. You see, we, we wouldn't have considered Acts chapter 1 or Acts chapter 2 to be any less complete if these structures had not been there in the text. We, we wouldn't have missed this if Peter's speech didn't have this this lovely structure. But it is there, embedded in the text, and it's just another proof, I think, of that what we have in our hands 
really is the word of the living God. So we're going to look now at the, the, the speech of Peter that we've just read together in Acts chapter 2. And what, what Peter does in this speech is first of all to explain to his audience that what they had witnessed on the day of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was actually a fulfilment of the prophecy of Joel in Joel chapter 2. We don't have time to look at that. But in the second part of his speech from verse 22 onwards... Peter continues to explain how that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead was also a fulfilment of Old Testament scripture with which the Jews were, or at least should have been, very familiar. If you just pick up the, the, the narrative in verse 22, Peter says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. So straight away, Peter introduces to his audience the subject that he wants to talk about. Jesus of Nazareth. A man. And very skillfully, Peter begins his argument on common ground. Everybody knew... In Jerusalem at that time, everybody knew about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter is at pains to point out that this was no ordinary man. He was approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs. And nobody living in Jerusalem could deny that this Jesus of Nazareth had indeed performed many miracles wonders and signs even even the pharisees and the chief priests were forced to admit after jesus had raised lazarus from the dead that this man had performed many miracles it says so in john chapter 11 so there could be no doubt about this fact that jesus of nazareth this man had performed miracles and wonders and signs and the conclusion that Peter draws from that is this, that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, the very fact that he'd been able to perform miracles and wonders and signs must mean that he was approved of God. So that's his point. But now he goes a step further than that and he points out that in actual fact, these Miracles and wonders and signs that Jesus did were really the works of God. Notice that, verse 22, miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. And so the works that Jesus performed and the gracious words that proceeded out, proceeded out of his mouth they weren't his, but they were of the Father. Just uh, keep your finger in Acts chapter 2. Come back a few pages to John chapter 14. And, and this is the occasion when, right at the end of the ministry of Jesus, Philip, one of his disciples, comes to Jesus and asks <coughs> what turned out to be a rather naive question. And I think this must have been a source of some disappointment to Jesus when Philip asked him this. Uh, in, in verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And just see how Jesus replied in verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. And so Jesus had been with his disciples for three years. 
and Philip, a little bit slow on the uptake, had still not realised what Jesus was doing, that he was demonstrating to them, in all its beauty, the character of the Father himself. And, and of course, this is the essence of the doctrine of God manifestation, isn't it? That Jesus spoke the words of God and performed the Father's works, not because he was God, or that he had no choice in the matter, but because he came as the Son of God to declare unto men the glory and the character of God. And so coming back then to Acts chapter 2, what, what Peter has shown us now is that the ministry of Jesus was of God. Jesus was approved of God, and by him, God revealed himself to the nation of Israel by miracles and wonders and signs. Now see what Peter says next, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So what Peter is showing here is that not only was the ministry of Jesus divinely ordained, but so was his death. Of course, that didn't excuse the people, those wicked men, for doing what they did in, in putting the Lord Jesus Christ to death. But what Peter is saying is that what they did was all in the divine plan. It was in the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, right from the beginning, that there should be a saviour who would die for the sins of men. And of course we can trace that right back, can't we, to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. But it doesn't stop there, because not only was the death of Jesus in the divine plan, so was his resurrection, verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that she, he should be holden of it. So the resurrection of Jesus was of God. It wasn't possible that Jesus should remain in the grave because of the righteousness of God. Because here for the first time ever was a man who had died, and yet who didn't deserve to die. Because of his sinlessness. If Jesus had remained in the grave in spite of his sinlessness, then God would have been shown to be unrighteous. And clearly that could not be. So Jesus had to rise from the dead in order that the righteousness of God should be declared for all to see. So can we see what Peter has done so far here? He's shown us that the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus were all part of God's purpose. So whilst the Jews thought that the, the crucifixion of Jesus was their own doing, it wasn't at all. In fact, it was God's. It was in God's plan right from the start. And, and furthermore, Peter now goes on to show that the resurrection of Jesus had been foretold in the Old Testament scriptures. And, of course, the Jews should have known this, because what Peter does now is to make a, an extended quotation from one of the Psalms, from Psalm 16. Verse 15, he says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And of course that's a quotation from Psalm 16, verses 8 to 10. And the question is, well who is that psalm really talking about? Whoever it was would not see corruption. So although David wrote Psalm 16, clearly P 
Peter is explaining that it couldn't really be talking about David because David was dead and buried. It had been for a thousand years or so. Everybody knew where David's sepulchre was. And that's the point that Peter makes in verse 29. He says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulchre is with us to this day. So clearly David wasn't the subject of Psalm 16. He, David must have been speaking about somebody else who would not see corruption. And of course we know that he is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But Peter goes on to say that David himself knew that the psalm spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Because David was a prophet and God had sworn with an oath to David. And the fulfilment of that oath could only come about through the resurrection of David's seed. Verse 30, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And of course, we all recognise that the reference here is to the covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel 7. And part of that oath <coughs> was that God would raise up David's seed to sit on his throne forever. Remember what God said? He said, I will set up thy seed after thee and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Thy throne and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. And so implicit in the, the Davidic covenant is the resurrection, not only of David himself, but also of the seed promised to David. And this is really what Psalm 16 is all about. And, and these Jews in Jerusalem had witnessed, if they had but recognized it they had witnessed the fulfillment of psalm 16 in the resurrection of the lord jesus christ now with that background of the covenant made with david i want you to just notice how the psalmist describes uh, the messiah in verse 27 he says because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One, to see corruption. Thine Holy One. That's an interesting phrase. Because in the Hebrew of Psalm 16, where this comes from, the Hebrew word is kasid, which means a favoured one. And it's, I believe, closely related to the, another Hebrew word, kesed, which means loving kindness. Or mercy. So, for example, Rotherham's translation of Psalm 16 says this. Neither wilt thou suffer thy man of loving kindness to see corruption. So this is how the Lord Jesus Christ is depicted in Psalm 16. Thy man of loving kindness. And it's interesting that this idea of mercy or loving kindness... Is a, is a concept that is intimately associated with the covenant made with David. Remember what God said to David in 2 Samuel 7? He said, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before thee. So God's mercy would, would continue with him forever. And implicit in this is the idea of the resurrection. So whenever, just a little clue, whenever you come across this Hebrew word kesed in the Old Testament, always think about the Davidic covenant. Let me just show you an example. Have a look at Psalm 89. Now Psalm 89 is a, 
is actually, it's a long psalm, but it's, it's really an inspired commentary on the Davidic covenant, on the covenant made with David. And it's interesting to note that this Hebrew word kesed is found seven times all the way through this psalm, translated by either by our English word mercy or loving kindness. And there's the references on the screen. In fact, if you look at the very beginning of the psalm, notice how the psalm begins. It says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. So this is what the psalm is about. It's about the seed of David who would endure forever and whose throne would be established for all generations as long as the moon <laughs> endures look at verse 28 pick up the davidic covenant references here my mercy will i keep for him forevermore and my covenant shall stand fast with him verse 33 nevertheless my loving kindness same word will i not utterly take away from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail Verse 36, his seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. So this is the theme of this psalm. It's all about the mercy, the loving kindness of God displayed in the Davidic covenant. And uh, in, at the beginning of this psalm, again, there's a, there's a nice little chiastic structure that serves to focus our minds on the covenant made with David there in verse 3 it says I have made a covenant with my chosen I have sworn unto David my servant thy seed will I establish forever and of course all of this the fulfillment of all of these things is absolutely and completely dependent upon the fact of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ God's man of loving kindness from the dead because it's by the resurrection of Jesus that God's mercy and his loving kindness is made known. Brothers and sisters, I think it's wonderful that all of these scriptures that we've been looking at, they all interlock and the message behind them is the same. And I think here again is another hallmark of inspiration. You can't do this with any other book only with the word of God. And the focus of all these scriptures is the, the everlasting covenant that God has made with David. And that we've all embraced through our association by baptism with his seed. And it was the prospect of, if we just come now to Psalm 16 very quickly. It was the prospect of the fulfillment of that covenant with the establishment of the kingdom that filled our Lord with joy. And this is really what the last verse of Psalm 16 is talking about. Verse 11. It says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And actually Peter stops his quotation from Psalm 16 just there for the moment. We shall see in a second that he completes the quotation. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. But notice here, again in this verse, that the emphasis is on life and joy. And it's not just this life, it's, it's the life, it's life forevermore. Remember how the writer to the Hebrews tells us that it was for the joy that was set before him that the Lord Jesus was able to endure the cross and to despise the shame and is set down now at the right hand of the throne of God. At thy right hand, it says, there are pleasures forevermore. And the apostles had witnessed his resurrection and his ascension to the Father's right hand. 
just go back now to Acts chapter 2 and see how Peter carries on his speech. Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. Acts 2 verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. And so the visible manifestation of the spirit that the Jews had seen and heard on the day of Pentecost was proof positive that Jesus had indeed been by the right hand of God exalted. And Peter there now is finally finishing off his quotation from Psalm 16. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Pleasures, notice that, forevermore. Implying, of course, once again, resurrection to everlasting life. Now, when we reach verse 34, Peter again makes the point, which is obvious to you and to me, that when David said that, he was clearly not talking about himself because he says, verse 34, David is not ascended into the heavens. So it wasn't David that was exalted to the right hand of God. So if David wasn't talking about himself in Psalm 16, then who was he talking about? And so Peter now very skillfully once again demonstrates that he must have been talking about Jesus Christ. And he does so by using the testimony of David himself in another of the Psalms. Psalm 110, verse 34, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. And of course the point here is that the one who would come to sit on the right hand of God, David called him my Lord. And we looked at this the other day, didn't we? Indicating that he would be greater than David, even though descended from David. And we know, don't we, how that the Lord Jesus Christ used this exact same scripture, the same line of reasoning when discussing with the Sadducees about the resurrection to prove that the Messiah would be not just the son of David, but also the son of God. Again, brethren and sisters, it's, it's just wonderful how all of the scriptures dovetail together and tell us the same story and reveal to us the whole counsel of God in its beauty. So just finally, when we get to verse 36 now, David here, uh, sorry, Peter here is blending together both of these psalms, Psalm 16 and Psalm 110, to show to the Jews that Jesus, the seed of David, the Son of God, whom they had crucified, was in fact both Lord and Christ. He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God, notice this, God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord of and Christ. So once again, everything is of God. God hath made that same Jesus, both Lord and Christ. They, they crucified him, but it was all by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God was at work raising up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. And we know that on, on, on this occasion... The, the power of Peter's exposition hit home and, and the awful realisation of what the Jews had done finally dawned. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? But Peter's final message wasn't a message of condemnation, 
But it was a message of hope. Because in this man, Jesus of Nazareth, yes, they crucified him, but in that man, there was hope of salvation and eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so Peter offers them the the hope of salvation. Repent and be baptised, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we brethren and sisters. In the mercy of God. Have also come to share that hope. And we look forward now with earnest expectation. To the day when he will come again. And receive us unto himself. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.